Space is unforgiven, at least for the machines that humans build. In an environment filled with nothing but energetic charged particles, gamma rays, hyperspeed cosmic dust, and unfiltered sunlight, it's very important that a spacecraft is tested in an environment similar to this on Earth before it's launched into space. But even then, the spacecraft has to stay within a certain operating range, because outside of that is not a place a spacecraft wants to be for any length of time. After all the subsystems of a spacecraft have been constructed, they are then assembled onto a chassis or spacecraft bus as it's called. At this point, the spacecraft can be tested as a whole to verify that it will perform as intended in its launch, deployment, and operation environments. The launch environment is the easiest to reproduce because it happens on Earth. The main factors here are vibrations and sound. These can be recreated with relative ease in a large room. Now for the deployment and operation environment, it's not that simple because it's in space. Most of the environmental factors that affect the spacecraft in space are not found in any meaningful quantities, if at all, on Earth. So, an isolated chamber must be created in which a spacecraft is placed to be tested. These environmental chambers are specifically called thermal vacuum chambers, space simulation chambers, or solar simulator depending on the setup. They try to recreate as much as possible the space environment. However, it's not possible to simulate a microgravity environment inside of a stationary facility. Luckily, microgravity does not affect the spacecraft as much. As for high energy radiation, this can be recreated using particle accelerators. But since most of the concerns that engineers have with high energy radiation is how they affect electrical components, these units can be tested separately in much smaller chambers. The main environmental factors of space are the vacuum, thermal energy from the sun, and the non-reflective nature of space itself. At the most basic, a spacecraft is placed inside the chamber and it's evacuated to create the vacuum. This is an important step because the lack of air and consequently air pressure greatly affects every part of the spacecraft. The first is outgassing. When air pressure is removed, all materials above absolute zero evaporate, even if it's just a few atoms at a time. This rate increases with temperature. Impurities and gases trapped in the material will start to slowly evaporate away. And this is where it starts to become a problem for the spacecraft. The evaporated material could condense on sensitive optical surfaces such as lenses and mirrors, making them less accurate at best and unusable at worst. The narrow angle camera on the Cassini spacecraft, for example, started capturing images with halo around bright objects due to outgassing. Unwanted electrical discharge can also occur when enough outgassing occurs near high voltage systems and wires. This can lead to unnecessary heat being generated causing component failure. These are some of the issues that can be detected simply by placing the spacecraft in a vacuum. But the pressure in the chamber has to be low enough for these issues to properly manifest. And this is where we start to see the first technical challenge that a thermal vacuum chamber has to overcome. Conventional piston and rotary pumps can only get down to 0.1 Pascal and that's not enough for the high vacuum the spacecraft will be exposed to. For reference, air pressure at sea level is about 101 kilopascal. The pressure needs to be reduced to about 10 micropascal to recreate the effects of the vacuum in low Earth orbit. A cryopump works in the following way. Inside the tube are two sets of surfaces kept at cryogenic temperature by the flow of liquid nitrogen or helium. The top set is kept at 65 Kelvin or minus 208 Celsius and the bottom is at 12 Kelvin or minus 261 Celsius. The bottom set also contains a layer of activated charcoal on the underside. As the air from the vacuum chamber passes over the top set of surfaces, water vapor and other high freezing point gases will instantly condense and freeze, effectively pulling them from the chamber. <laughs> 
The rest of the gases in the air, like nitrogen and oxygen, will pass through to the lower set of surfaces where they will condense pulling them out of the air. Finally, for gases that cannot condense without first being compressed, gases such as hydrogen and helium, the activated charcoal under the lower set of surfaces will cause these molecules to be adsorbed. That is, they will temporarily stick to the charcoal. And since the charcoal is porous and has many cavities, these molecules will become trapped in the charcoal, effectively removing them from the vacuum chamber. This is how the cryo pump creates a really low pressure vacuum inside of a thermal vacuum chamber. With the vacuum chamber settled, we now look at the thermal side of things. The temperature of a spacecraft can fluctuate between minus 170 to 123 degrees Celsius in low Earth orbit. This range is even wider in deep space or near the Sun. Since space lacks an atmosphere, the only method for heat transfer is radiation. But heat generated by one part of the spacecraft can also be transferred via conduction to other parts. A spacecraft in space can receive heat from various sources. The Sun is obviously one of them, but another important source of heat is the Earth itself if it's nearby. The Earth reflects and retransmits about 30% of the incoming sunlight back into space. This is strong enough to act as another source of heat radiation that spacecraft near Earth have to account for during testing. To simulate the various heat sources, the thermal vacuum chamber has two mechanisms, a thermal shroud and a thermal platen. The thermal shroud wraps around the inside of the chamber, including the door. Inside the shroud are tubes that either carry a cryogenic fluid or a heated fluid. The shroud is also covered with a material that's highly emissive but non-reflective as much as possible. Heating up the chamber is straightforward. Hot fluid is run through the shroud and that heat is radiated into the chamber. Now, for cooling, it's not that simple. An object cannot be cooled by radiation from another object, like the way it's done in heating. Space is considered cold because the lack of matter means that nothing is nearby to radiate, conduct, convect, or reflect energy towards the spacecraft. And since all matter above absolute zero lose energy via radiation, an object will cool down to near absolute zero. A chamber would have to be infinitely big to simulate the non-reflectivity of space. Since this is not possible, the low reflective material on the shroud simulates that. And the reason that it's cooled is to transfer the energy that's hidden the shroud out of the chamber. Otherwise, its temperature would rise and it would become another unwanted radiation source. The thermal platen works in a similar way like the shroud, but instead uses conduction for heat transfer to and from the spacecraft, since the spacecraft sits right on top of it. In a typical thermal vacuum testing of a spacecraft, the air is removed and the spacecraft is cycled through a series of hot and cold cycles to simulate operation in space like orbiting a planet where the sun is blocked at some point in the orbit. This is fine in many cases, but sometimes it's important to not only radiatively heat the spacecraft, but also do it at the proper frequency of light that the sun is emitting. So, the thermal vacuum chamber is extended to become a solar simulator with the addition of an external high energy light source. An array of high energy lamps are placed outside of the chamber. These lights are usually carbon arc or xenon lights, but LED lamps are starting to be used. The light from the array is first focused through an optical viewport and into the thermal vacuum chamber. Once inside, this beam hits the collimation mirror. The purpose of this mirror is to convert the incoming convergent beam to a nearly parallel one, then redirect it towards the spacecraft under test. The beam needs to be parallel since the light from the sun is parallel due to its large distance from all the planets. This is an important part of the testing since a parallel beam will heat up a spacecraft differently than a conventional convergent-divergent one. This is due to a collimated beam hitting all parts of a perpendicular surface at a right angle, while a convergent-divergent one will hit the surface at various angles, heating it up differently. With the solar simulator added to the vacuum chamber, we can now simulate some of the most difficult aspects of space. But space is not just about heat and vacuum. There are other aspects that need to be simulated before launch. One example is the communications antenna. Low gain and high gain. 
In order to determine the characteristics of these antennas when they're transmitting and receiving and at different attitudes relative to Earth, all radio wave reflections must be eliminated. But just like the issue with reflective thermal radiation inside a chamber, radio wave reflection will happen in any size chamber unless its size is infinite. And just like the solution used in the thermal vacuum chamber, we need to add radio wave absorbers on the walls of the testing room. These rooms are called RF anechoic chambers because they eliminate radio echoes as much as possible. This is primarily done with the grid of pyramid-shaped RF absorbers. These are shaped in such a way that first, for the radio waves that are not absorbed but reflected off these pyramids, they are reflected more in the direction of the pyramid and not back to the source. Second, the reflection coming off two adjacent pyramids will cancel each other out to a large extent. With radio reflection minimized, the effects the spacecraft structure has on its antenna can now be isolated. Spacecraft go through more tests than listed here, but these are the important ones. Even CubeSats go through them. There's one additional important test that only relatively few spacecraft have to be subjected to. That is verification of COSPAR recommendation category four. COSPAR stands for Committee on Space Research, and these recommendations are there to prevent biological cross-contamination between Earth and potential life harboring planets or other celestial objects. Missions are classified in five categories. Category three and below address the issues of flying close to a celestial body that is of significant interest to the origin of life. Among other precautions, a spacecraft may have to fly a biased trajectory towards its target. That is, the trajectory at launch will miss the target, but when the spacecraft is close, it will adjust its trajectory to actually target the planet for a flyby only. This is done to prevent the spacecraft from crashing into the planet if control is lost during the cruise phase. Category 5 is focused on sample return mission, so it has little impact on the spacecraft requirement before launch. Now, category 4 is for landers and orbiters destined to celestial objects significant to the evolution of life. The spacecraft must be decontaminated and partially or fully sterilized. Sterilization is done on individual components before assembly, and during assembly, they are periodically wiped down with alcohol. And so, those are the main ways that spacecraft are tested before they are launched into space. Regardless of the fact that Earth is in space, the atmosphere that protects us gives us a distorted look of that space. Many ancient humans thought that at night the gods covered the Earth with a blanket, when in fact it was the exact opposite. At night, we get to see space the way it really is. Dark, cold, and full of stars. And if we ever plan to reach these stars, we need to know more about the environments in which they exist. The more we can test our machines in these environments while on Earth, the safer our journey will be. I'm Dex DFX for the Celestial Sphere.